All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me on this uh, experimental code walkthrough, talk about things. Um, I really want to talk about a whole bunch of stuff, but really, I want to, the main thing I want to talk about is kind of like answer questions that people have about what it takes to actually publish packages in Python. That's kind of the, the goal of this. It stemmed from initially from a conversation I had with Joe, but then actually um, a couple other people also had made comments about like things that they wish they knew how to do, and they kind of certain uneasiness about like how do i actually do these things um and so i, I kind of want to walk through what it takes um we have a little bit of an agenda anytime you want to ask something just interrupt me and ask like this is not super formal um but uh okay so actually before i start are there any specific things you want me to get to let me take some i think everything you laid out at the beginning uh and uh control sounds pretty good Excellent. I'm going to copy those things here. And for those of you watching, we're talking about we'll the YAML file. It's markdown file. How are we going to do? There you go. Uh, for those of you who are watching, the thing that we're talking about is this package called EasyQ. And that's the URL for it. It'll all be in the description. Links will be in the description. Uh, I don't even know what I'm talking about. Okay. Like, comment, and subscribe. Yeah, 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 exactly. Of course, all the magic words. All right. Uh, hello. So, um, all right. This is what we're going to talk about. So, the first thing is identify a need and pick a name. So, uh, Joe had asked me, like, how did you come up with this idea? So, the thing we're talking about is this thing called EasyQ, which is a wrapper for Python multiprocessing. And um, it actually started with a project called Hebphonics, where I was working on um, processing lots of Hebrew text in parallel as a way of building a corpus um, that would then be parsed to teach children who are learning how to read for, uh, you know, like need phonetic help. And um, when I was doing that, there was like a lot of text I wanted to process in parallel. And I finally was like, okay, yeah, yeah, I should do this with multiprocessing. And in the past, every single time I've ever done something with multiprocessing, I basically have to go read all those articles that you find when you search for like Python multiprocessing. I'm like, okay, you get to the Python page that says like, oh yeah, this is the Python multiprocessing page. But then when you actually get to it, um, it, it, it's like, how do I actually make this work in a kind of robust way? And it's always like, oh yeah, you start a process and there's the other thing called daemon. And then like, is that, how, what is that, what is the impact? So it's like all these little decisions you have to make. And I didn't like making those decisions every single time. I usually, when I ended up remembering that I had done this before and I look at what I did before, I almost always made the same decision. So like it felt pointless to have to go through that process every time, but it just wasn't easy. It just wasn't easy to like, do this basic thing where I want to use some number of my CPUs to do a thing. Um, and the other thing that I wanted was it was like a multi-step thing. So I basically had like some processes were like downloading and pressing and doing an initial processing of the data and had another step that was gonna like actually add it to the database. So, but I didn't want all the different workers to be putting stuff in the database at the same time because then it would cause conflicts. Right. So I needed like one CPU to basically be focusing on putting stuff in the database and the other ones to be can work in parallel it's totally independent so the normal way you do this is with queues right you you each one of these things is putting stuff in a queue that the other one cpu worker is basically pulling off that queue and doing their stuff um so there's actually two queues right there's one queue that all the let's call them readers are are that are reading all the text are reading off of they're just pulling from that queue and doing their work and then they're putting stuff on a right queue that one cpu is actually just doing all the work with the database and because most of the work was in the read step, I didn't mind that it was kind of like this fanned out thing that went to a narrow thing. Anyhow, that was the original need for it. Later on, uh, when we we're doing some like biotech stuff, um, I had I encountered a similar situation where it was like, oh, I need to read all these DNA files and produce some particular kind of output. Um, and then uh, you know, I basically ended up copying the same blocks of code over and over again. And that was kind of my first indication that like, oh, this is probably an, a more generic need. This is probably a thing that I need to pull out. Um, and so I had pulled it out as a thing inside of, uh, I, I kind of like ref started refactoring it. And ultimately I refactored it into the library you see here. In terms of picking a name, there's a great book um, called, I'm blanking on the name of the second, Crafting, Crafting Interpreters. Very nice book. Um, 
the website is also going to be in the description. It's called craftinginterpreters.com. Um, I do need to just paste the links here. That will be a nice segue to the thing. So anyhow, craftinginterpreters.com. And there he talks about picking a name also. Basically, you want names that are like easy to type, that are memorable, that aren't going to clash with anything else. Um, and so EasyQ, <laughs> I was really shocked. There's like not a Python package called EasyQ. Um, I guess, you know, all the dot coms have already been taken. All three letter dot com names have taken. All the, all the nice things have, have been taken. But, you know, every time someone creates a namespace, there's a place for people to try to get the best namespace, you know, name in the namespace. Go ahead, Joe. Although there is a user on GitHub called EasyQ. So when, it, when you look there up is. GitHub EasyQ, I was like, there is. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I didn't think to type when I was doing my search. I just typed in EasyQ and I typed it. I searched in Google and I searched in Python. I did not think to type the word GitHub EasyQ because that's another thing. Like you have to think about how people are going to discover your thing. And you're right. A lot of people would probably type EasyQ and GitHub. Um, so this isn't a perfect, perfect name, but it's a pretty good name. Um, and it's so short and it kind of describes what it is. Um, so that's that. Anyhow, um, any questions on that? No, cool. All right, moving on. Um, I don't know if I need to do these in this particular order. Is there, is there something that's like the most important thing that people want to care about or no? Just, uh, I thought testing and code coverage was really cool. Um, but yeah, let's do you want me to try to start, should I start with that? I can start with that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So, um, unit tests. Like, what are unit tests? Why do you do them? What are doc tests and code coverage? Okay. So this entire library um, is pretty small. There's like 229 lines, but like most of it is documentation, right? There's only I think what is GitHub report? GitHub reports that the actual code itself is 183 lines of of actual code. Um, and the number of methods is also pretty small. There's there's not that much, right? There's like a few, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven functions, um, a couple of objects you can construct, and that's about it. Um, and so uh, this is like a very tiny case, but I did want to do like the whole full suite of like all the things you need to do. So unit testing basically is it serves two two purposes. Purpose number one is to make sure that you're building that like small changes that you make don't mess up um, other things that you write. There are, there are very few if statements in this entire thing, but there are a few. There's a few like try this thing if this kind of situation. There's a few different like edge cases that need to be handled. Here's an example, right? So like um, I can go through all this code if you want at some point, but but basically there are a few edge cases that you want to handle, and in order to Kind of give us confident, um, uh, you know. Then, then uh, it's it's basically like it gives you confidence that if you make a change, that you actually end up going, um, yeah, you don't end up messing anything else up. The other thing that it's useful for is um, it kind of shows how your code is supposed to work. It's like a little bit of a demo of this is what you this is what you're capable of doing. So. Um, there's some very simple cases, and then the cases get more and more complicated as you go. So I'll walk you through a particular example, like this thing called iterQ that iterates over a queue using an it more like an iterator paradigm, right? So instead of trying to dequeue from the thing, it just basically you walk, you walk, you do four message in that queue, and it just steps over the queue until it there's nothing else in there, until it reaches the the you know until it's all done. Um, so let's do the simple thing. Let's go put a thousand things in the queue, and let's make sure that the sum of those things is equal to the the total, which when, is basically. So when yeah. you were designing those tests, do you mostly do one to one tests, like one test function per function in your main library? Uh, no, no. So this is like another, uh, for very small functions, yes. Like if mm. it's really, really small. So like iter queue does one thing, it, it calls that like iter message. With a couple of particular parameters, it's a very, very simple thing. There's not a lot of edge cases around how it's supposed to behave. So there, I just write one, one function. I just test this case. There's no. It's 
this is right. This is just like test iter cube, but this is like sort iter. Uh, well, there's a couple different ways you want to sort iteration. Like there might be stuff, right? There might be things missing, but this is like sort a list of numbers that are already sorted. I want this to be super fast and basically run a particular case. This one is like, it's all randomized and shuffled, right? This one is like, um, basically like I'm putting in this like order attribute, right? I want to make sure that that works. This is with a gap. I'm sorting all the messages, but there's a gap in the messages. So like the messages are being added to the queue and then there's a gap and then there's more messages. It's a different use case, a different edge case. So it's not, it's not, it's not one to one. It's one to many, right? Sometimes that many is just one if it's really, really simple. And it sounded like you had kind of developed these tests before, you know, putting this in production into like, you know, having everything. Yeah, yeah. It was, it's sort of like, as I was refactoring, I started getting that feeling of like, wait, does this still work for all my use cases? So mm -hmm. you don't, I mean, there are people who do like uh, test driven development that's like super pure, right? Where they'll say things like, write every test before you write the code. And that sounds like really magical. I already had a bunch of code that was like refactoring, cleaning up. I have very, very rarely, unless I'm making a very small change or I'm just like, I've already, everything's already the right way and I'm adding one more thing. I very rarely first. But if, if, if basically like, if I was to be adding some small feature to EasyQ today, I'd probably write the test first. Okay. Because I want to make sure that like, I've defined what I think this behavior is. It also kind of writing the test gets me to, um, I, I think other people have asked me this question before, but like, do you write how you want to use it first and then write the thing? Yes, that I'll do. So like, I'll I'll pretend to call the function and I'm like, yeah, I, I call it, I kind of imagine that I call it this way. Um, and that could be the test, right? But I only really write the test first if I, if it's a small thing and I just need to make sure that I'm expressing that thought correctly. Practically speaking, you usually write out a whole bunch of different methods, and then um, I will do it by object. Like if I had a if I had a, an object with a bunch of methods, I will start writing those tests kind of around the time that I start writing the thing. But a lot of times you're trying to define what the language around the code should be and how it should really behave. And so until you've kind of nailed that down, the tests are a little too brittle, right? They're just going to be like immediately not working. And so once you kind of have the language of like this is how you express this thought this is how you're going to invoke it this is how you're actually going to use it that's around the time when you want to write a test cool cool all right um doc tests so doc tests there's not a lot of doc tests here um but there are i can show you a different different thing um up a level and go to a different a different thing I recently published which is called Adderbox. Um, let's use this as an example. So a doc test is a test that you put in the documentation. Um, here's an example, right? So this is an example of building uh, an object and there's a constructor. So you literally I write like examples. These examples all get run and must return these results for the test to pass. So that's what that's what a doc test is. Um, let me show you a slightly more complicated example. This is a very simple object. Like it didn't even make sense to write tests in a separate test thing. Like this thing by itself has a it's a type of dictionary, right? So it has init, a fail method, an error method, and a success method. That's it. It has three methods. There, it's basically largely an object that contains some information. It's very very little behavior. There's like I don't even know if there's an if statement anywhere in here. Like there's no conditions, there's no loops, there's no nothing. It just returns itself and does a little update to itself. So it's so simple that I didn't want to make another file that has to test these things. The tests are all just an example. Here's how you do it. You say construct the object. You say dot success on the data. We assert that it is the thing that right since it returns self. Um, in this way, this object is different than dictionary because when you do something to it, it also returns itself, which lets you in theory do chaining. So you can say like dot success dot whatever. And uh, I like those kinds of chaining methods where the thing, if it doesn't have anything obvious to return, just return yourself. And then, then you could chain that object and do a bunch of things at the same time. Anyhow, that data is the same data. True, it's all good. Um, so that's an example of a doc test. 
Um, and then code coverage. Code coverage is basically a report that you get. Um, and I can show you how you would actually get these things. Uh, if we jump down to... So like the, the way you actually run, run the unit tests is with something called PyTest. And then you can also install um, this thing called code coverage, which is it's called pytest-cove. And what it will do is it will send, when you run all your unit tests and your doc tests, um, then it will print out a report that basically says which lines and how many of lines and what percentage of the lines are, are covered by the tests. So ideally, I want 100%. I want every line in my code to have at least been tested once. Um, some tests, some lines will be tested a lot more because they use a lot, you know, you have a bunch of tests, some code will get run a lot more. But ideally, you'd like every if statement, every version of everything to happen at least once. OK, practically speaking, there are some things that it, where it doesn't happen, right? So like, I have some code here to handle type checking, which we'll get to on the agenda, I guess, maybe next, or in a couple things. Um, so but like, there's no way for the tests to actually um, get into this line of code because type checking only happens during the type checking process. It won't happen when you run the unit test. This is a very specific Python check that basically checks to see if we're doing a type check on this code. Um, so therefore, how, I have to say, yeah, go ahead. How, how is coverage evaluated? Is it just saying like, you know, every fun is it just that every function in your oh no no, no. every line is... every line every single line how does uh you're how saying does how it does it that? work what's the mechanism of code coverage yeah so they actually like they inject themselves into a bunch of different places um okay. you can you can you can hook into the way the python interpreter is actually stepping through the line and you can you can grab information from there to see that that line was evaluated um uh I guess practically, like some of your tests are just on, like you know, it's like on a full function. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, I, yeah. So like I, this test, right? So this test, um, if I only ran one test, it would only run that block of code that is invoked by like constructing of that object, that method, and or sorry, that function and this function, right? Those are okay. the only three functions that I called. My question is, if I run all of the tests, am I covering all of the code? Okay. Yeah, I want all the code that I've written to be covered. But again, here I'm showing you how you basically say like, yeah, but not here. Okay. Like, don't like don't count this towards the lines that need to have code coverage. This entire if block or the contents of this if block. This one still has to be evaluated, but this one won't be. And the reason it can't be is because type checking this. This is a from typing, right? From typing import type checking. The purpose of this thing is to basically tell, is to separate between when your code is going through a type checking process and when your code is, um, is, is uh, when your code is being evaluated normally. Let me give you a different example, because that's a weird example. This whole thing is like a problem, yeah. right? This, so this before, whole thing. Before uh, you put in that inline comment, yeah, you know, yeah, the code yeah, coverage would have like seen like, oh, yes. we're running through all our tests and we're not checking those two lines. Exactly. And we, I can't get issue. to those lines. There's no test that gets to that lines. So here's another example. I could not generate a test that could get to this line. Now I know this is a situation that I need to handle. And there's like a bug in Python that like whatever you could read this issue if you're really interested, right? But I knew that like I can't I couldn't make a test that actually gets to this point. Things were the way. The combination of the is a very specific situation, right? But normally you would like to try to test. Those are the only two. I think it was the only two lines. Um, yeah, there's only two like weird edge cases where there's specific issues in Python that I can't make a test get to those lines. Where I'm basically saying like, code coverage, don't worry about it. Is that a standard method for test development to let code coverage like say which lines are not tested and then develop yeah. tests for those? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. It's it's very common. Very common, where okay. it's like, okay, I think I've written all my tests, and then code coverage is like, yeah, but you didn't cover this if statement, like, okay. or you didn't cover this if statement. When you, like, this if statement was always true, or this if statement was always false. It'll tell you about that too, and then you'll be like, oh, like ah, I didn't cover that case. 
That's good. If you didn't cover that case, go make a new test case, right? Go write a new unit test that's going to cover that particular case. Make sense? Yeah. How, how do you check code coverage? This is like a Python package, or this is with GitHub? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's all, it's all. Yeah, yeah. So, so if it's like PyTest, for example, which is my favorite, my favorite way of doing things. Um, PyTest has a, a thing that you can pip install another thing called PyTest Cove, which is a plugin to PyTest that gives Py. Let me here. I'll show you. I'll just run this. I'll run this line of code, and you can see what it looks like to get code coverage. So it's boring, but it's uh, oh, I need to <laughs> I need to go. In, I need to activate my shell, which hilariously is using a tool called LVDev, which we'll ignore for now. One day, one day we'll release some of these tools. But um, normally, you would pip install all those other things, right? And then you do this. Okay, so it ran all the tests, right? So there's each of those dots represents one of the tests. Right. And it said, like, okay, how many statements were in this thing? There was 59 statements and there were 18 branches. And we our code coverage is 100 percent Okay. And so by having that in this YAML file, GitHub sorry, actions, this we'll, YAML file we'll, we'll get do to that this. after. Yeah, will, GitHub actions. Actions. yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. So if you were doing so, this on your own, you do this command line and check code coverage. Correct. Okay. Now I have a short, I have shorter way of typing this. Um, but this is basically yes. This is exactly. what I'm saying here, just to break this up, right? So it's I'm setting Python path to a source directory because I have um, easy Q slash sources where I'm actually storing all these files. Then I say do code coverage on the package called easy Q. And then um, I also want to run PyTest with all the tests, the test directory, all the tests that are in the test directory. There's only one file in the test directory called test easy Q. And then I also say dash dash co branch because I want it to provide branch coverage also. So not just how many statements, but also I want to cover every branch. What does that mean? So statements are like, um, uh, like here, this line, this line, these are all statements, right? Branches are like if. Okay. I want to say I want to make sure that I I do all the counterfactuals also. So I want this to be I want this to check that not like if this is always true, then you've never count you've never handled the case where this is not true. If this is always false, then you've never covered the I mean then you then you've missing statements also. So branch coverage ensures that you do both ways of every branch. That anytime there's a decision that needs to be made, should I, should if this or that, that you at least have a test that does one way, and and the other way. You have to at least cover those two cases. That's um, awesome. So right, so this is an example in this particular case. So this is saying like, if I'm not waiting and the next thing is whatever, then just yield the item and kind of the hell. Yeah, that's my what this is, right? This is sort iter. This will sort any iterator iterable thing, right? And so there's a little a little list of things where it can kind of hide stuff if there's a gap. So for example, you have a queue full of messages. The messages may, in theory, come out of order. And so what you want to do is you want to iterate over the messages in order. So you always want to get the next message that you iterate over. You would like to be the next message sorted correctly. Now, the messages may be coming uh, periodically. You might not have all the messages yet. So it's not like you can just sort the whole. It's not a list. It's a queue. So what we're doing here is this, this, this thing, sort iter, lets you basically take a generator and sort and yield those things kind of as they're coming. Now, this is the happy path. There's nothing, I'm not waiting for anything. There's no, there's no messages that are kind of waiting to be processed. And the next item is exactly the net is exactly one more than the previous item. So I have the last item I processed and this one is the next one in that needs to be yielded. Okay. So increment my keeping track of where I am, yield that item, and just continue through the loop, right? So this is great if, for example, this case, um, sort here. If I'm trying to sort a list that's already sorted, it's all just going to basically pipe through here and not add anything to the list. It'll just very quickly go through each of those items. Um, there's nothing waiting. The next item is the, right, the key that I'm providing is identity. So like I have a list of things 
that are like zero through 999. Um, and I'm just iterating over all of them. And you're basically going to iterate as fast as you possibly can. Right? And basically say like next message, okay. And the next the next the next one you pull off the queue is the next one that needs to be result returned. You yield that back out and you continue through the loop again and again and again. This is the happy path. Okay, but what if the things came out of order? So now it's like, okay, wait. I um I need to go append this. I need to sort it in place. And now, as long as what I have in the waiting queue is good, right? Then we pop those things off the off the list. And basically yield those things. So we can yield those messages back out until we hit a point when the messages there's a gap, right? Anyhow, um, so that's that's how you do that. That's how you do testing. Any any more questions on tests? No. Okay. This will be a little thing here. Uh, black and pylint and flake eight. These are all basically things that try to help you. Um, Keep your code uniform. So black is a code formatter. Pylint is a, what's called a linter. And Flakegate is also a, it's also a type of checker. They basically are all checking different things. So black is, is easy because there's basically no configuration. You run black, you, you, you basically run it like this, black. And it'll be like, yep, and change anything. Now, uh, if I, for example, here's an example. Actually, probably can't even save this without it automatically formatting. Yeah, I already have black installed in VS Code. And so VS Code will automatically run block on every time I hit save. Um, and so basically, uh, if I did, um, I think even if I did something like this, it would just, uh, it auto changes it. That's really cool. Um, right. So it keeps everything really clean and following a single style. Go ahead. For most of these, do you typically like check these command line, check these before you? Like how how often are you just relying on GitHub Actions or on your YAML to like? Oh yeah 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 yeah. Or checking. Okay, that, that's a, that's a great great question. So so PyTest and all of its associated code coverage stuff. I'm doing that basically every time I run a test or every time I make a change, like locally. I'm I'm constantly running that. Um, Black, like I said, I already have basically installed in VS Code. Pilot, I also have it set up to basically um, highlight. I mean, here, let me show you. There was one thing I had to disable for Pilot. Here's an example. Um, OK, the pilot message is the error that is the problem for why this is whole thing is happening. So the whole problem here is that in Python, q.q, .q, which is the thing that stuff is inheriting from, um, is um, it's not properly a generic. It's a mistake. This is a mistake in um, the actual, this is like a, pro, um, uh, a bug in the way the Python code, the Python native code works. And you can read the Stack Overflow about people talking about it. So when you're doing type checking, you need to say this. But when you're running real code, you need to write this. And so if I remove this, if I remove that, notice, by the way, that all that extra white space just got deleted when I saved. Right? The reason that happens is because of black. Black removes all the extra white space. OK. Yeah. I'm instantly a convert to VS Code and Black. <laughs> yeah, it's it's Thanks. it's great stuff. So if I remove yeah. that, if I remove that, then um, actually I think, you know, yeah, at some point, at some point, some process is going to eventually kick in and be like, hey, that line problem. Um, but in theory, if I run this, it should be like, it'll be like, oh, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. That's not allowed. That's an unsubscriptable object. Now, of course, it's unsubscriptable. That's a mistake, right? That was the whole. That's the whole problem. And so then, okay, I fix it. Now, PyLake will get you for a lot of things. So I have a bunch of settings of my own, and you can see them in GitHub. Which ones I've chosen, but I want a ten out of ten. I want perfect. But um, I've configured it to not yell at me for particular kinds of things. Um, I can actually show you some of that here. Uh, so some of the things that I've added that I just don't like being yelled at, which is like broad exception. You have my this, I've included my my snarky comments about, um, like yeah, but did you see that I caught several narrow exceptions <laughs> first, right? Thanks. So it will yell at you, but like okay, 
these things that it yells at you, don't worry, Black will take care of these. So don't yell at me about this. Um, it yells at you if you have like fix me or to do or something written in your code. Okay, but fine. I want to keep those things. Don't yell at me about that. Um, I, I hate when it yells at me about my naming convention. I just hate it. I, I really don't like it. So I want it to be quiet about that. Um, Sorry, and these are your general settings or is this like project specific? So like how does these are project these are project specific this okay. is pilot so there's a pilot rc file that's for project but i copy basically my i have my standard this is my okay. standard pilot rc that i copy with me everywhere i go because i've already snarkily disabled the things that it can yell at you by the way this is the standard stuff that they recommend you disable which just gives you a sense of how nitpicky pilot can be pilot is very nitpicky right it yells at you at all these things these are the things that they highly recommend you disable which is fantastic but there's a whole bunch of other things I would like it to disable. And you can see my reasoning for the way that I talk about it. Um, right, so like too few plug book methods. I'm sorry, but some pub, some objects just have like a couple of me public methods. That's it, that's all they have. Like don't <laughs> yell about me. Like, uh, no, this feels annoying. So anyhow, that's my own snarky thing. Um, Flake 8, Flake 8 is also a similar, it's very similar. It has its own list of things that you can yell at you about. And so um, the the folks that I got this from, uh, like this default like Flake Eight thing, they're like, okay, exclude a bunch of things, and there's like their messages have names like E9, whatever. They want specifically like syntax errors and undefined names are the things that it's going to check. Technically, Pilot already checked all these things, but since this was a standard thing that other people were using, I'm like, sure, I will also pass this this bar. Like, I will also pass the bar of making sure Flake Eight is happy for this weird set of stuff okay okay so, so that's kind of where that's coming from and so you recommend like these three as like standard like yeah structuring yeah. formatting and and you can also make yourself like a little shell script that basically just calls all three back to back to back okay right github actions it's nice to have it broken out so you can see what's happening in each one but you could just call these back to back and just have some dev script that's just like run run tests or test or some some basic thing that you could just run it without having to type out the the full long you know command line stuff um but these three i recommend as like if you're using black and vs code it will just make all your code clean and correct and you won't you'll never get into a fight about style because it's just like it's one style and that's it um pilot is nice just because there's a lot of nitpicky things and Flake 8 is just sort of like, it also can pick out nitpicky things. It's a different set of nitpicky things, whatever. But if you pass those three, people will recognize your code as being like generally Pythonic in style. So let me talk about the next thing, which is kind of a hard bar to pass, which is MyPy. So in, in Python 3.6, I think it was, they added um, type checking hints. So Python is not a type, strongly typed language. Um, you can assign a variable to, a number and then right you can you can do this right you can say like x equals one equals foo right there's a bad an eyelash there's no there's no way of knowing what x is a priori um but type hints basically are a way where you can indicate to the um you can indicate to the interpreter like and to users that for this type of variable i expect this type right so block is a boolean you see this in the documentation also. Um, and if you install, I forgot the name of the, there's a VS Code extension that will do like comments for you. Better, no, better comments is very nice. I highly recommend. But there is also, there's one that just like auto generates. I forgot what it's called. Something, yeah, Python doc string. This is nice. If you basically write this, if you write this part, if you write this part, yeah, let me show you an example. Oh, my type too fast. Da, da, da. Generate doc string. It will do the majority of the work for you. Do, do you recommend having both? Like, yes. Okay. I'll explain why in a bit. But um, it's annoying because then you have to. You're saying like, if you change this, then you have to change it here too. That is an annoying thing. Um, but this is good because sometimes the, the types are good from the perspective of the type checker. Um, this is good if you're generating documentation. If you're ever going to want 
like to generate any kind of documentation that describes what these things are, this is what's going to end up getting pushed into the documentation generator. So that's the reason to have it here. Um, so that's just like a, a nice little VS Code extension that just sort of just makes it easier to write documentation. And so I use that a lot. It, 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 but it also captures like what things default to, right? So it knows it knows what's going on. Um, any case, um, there's a, a very strict version of of MyPy um, dash dash strict dash dash strict basically means I have properly annotated everything. That's a hard bar to pass. I would not recommend starting with this if this is the first time doing type checking. It's a, a good bar to pass in the sense that I, for every single kind of thing, I've said what its type is. So like, if you just had a message object, I'm not going to go documenting all these different pieces. It's basically like, there's three things. There's a string, whatever you want, and a number, right? And you kind of get that from this little message class. It's a data class. So it's like, it, it just holds three pieces of information. What kind of thing is this? What does it have inside? And what order should it be processed in? So, um, yeah. Go so ahead. type checking is just on every like parameter? Every part, parameter, like, every variable, every attribute. You got it. No, uh, not like yeah. a variable like used within, right? Like if you go to a random function. So here, like yeah, message right? gets one of these things, right? I didn't have to uh -huh. specify that. That's correct. Because this okay. thing can only return one of those things. Okay. And the reason is because Q here, here's why. Q is of type message Q. Message Q is a is a Q that takes a message, which means the type checker already knows what type of thing this is. It's a message. Wow. Okay. And that's why so, it's not gonna yell when you say dot kind, because it knows that messages have a kind. That's really cool. So strict just ensures that every single yeah, 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 yeah. I'll give okay. you an example. Here's an example. Inside this function, I said prev is start minus one. I didn't have to say what kind of thing prev is because start I've already defined as being an int, right? However, this internal internal to this function, there's this thing called waiting, which is some kind of list. Mm, what kind of thing is waiting? Well, hmm, I'm taking interval of any kind of thing. I'm starting to add it to this list. Uh, so it's a list of any kind of thing. Oh, I did not realize you can do that, like inline code. Inline, yes. You can, anywhere in Python, you can say variable name colon what kind of thing it is, and then and then continue with your assignment. Crazy. So does is there generally an error? Is it only, only... strict? Only strict is going to yell about this. OK. Because it says, well, there's an implied any here, right? If I had here, let me show you what happens. Let's let's run this. I'll get rid of the verbose because you don't need to see that's just the verbose is there for when you do GitHub actions so that you don't um so you can if something goes wrong, you can find out why. Let's do a strict. Uh yeah, everything else is fine. Okay, no issues, right? Now let's comment that out. This, yeah, and let's say strictly. What's the problem? Ah, there's a problem. This waiting doesn't. I don't know. I don't know what kind of thing you actually want to put in waiting. Now, if I turn off the strict, I'm pretty, I think this won't yell at you. Just do that. I'll be happy with the client. Nope, I'm wrong because I didn't. Did I hit save? I didn't hit save. Never mind. I'm wrong. Um, still, that that's still pretty crazy. That it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's basically wonder. seeing. Yeah. Wow. It's seeing that this thing is a list where you haven't specified what kind of thing you need to put inside that list. So it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's a list of anything because this isn't just for messages. This is for any kind of iterable. Sort iter technically will work on lists of numbers, on any kind of generator, anything, anything, right? And so it's some kind of iterable thing that has stuff inside, and then we're adding stuff. Right, we're pending waiting with that item where item is some item in those items. Items is any, therefore, list is of any. So that's a, yeah. Um, 
there are things that you learn along the way, which are things like if you have a, if you want to pass a function, like I need to pass a function here, it's some kind of callable. Um, they take little bracket things that basically say like, what are the parameters, and then what is the result. I, I, this is a function that could take any parameters and return any result. So it's this is the most generic way of describing any, a function. Um, if you use like variable variable arguments or keyword arguments, the type the type hint that you provide after that is for uh, one of those things. So like if I only took strings, I could say stir here, um, but I take any kind of arguments. So those are any. And then the way you return stuff is you say like, and the type of the return is a process. Um, yeah. I think that's, that's really cool. I think that's pretty clear. Okay, cool. So that's, that's, um, that's what type checking is. Okay. Uh, doc strings markdown. We talked a little bit about doc strings when we talked about um, uh, basically uh, doing doc tests. Doc strings themselves, right, are this tri triple quoted thing. These strings are used for documentation. So if you use a thing like pdoc3, which I can show you how, what it looks like to run that. Um, pdoc3 just generates HTML files. And you can actually see these if you go to um, the documentation for this. Um, I'll put the I'll put this link. It generates that HTML file. Now, I did cheat a little bit, and I'll explain how I cheated. Um, and it's a cheat that I'm now using basically everywhere, which is. When it's, it, it, it pulls from the package, right? So it uses Markdown uh, in a very particular way. You can include Markdown in the doc string. PDoc3, is, or this PDoc is from PDoc3. It's a, it, um, it's a fork of a different Python documentation system. They've, they've been forked a bunch of times. Anyhow, what I do is I write most of the documentation in the readme. And then I basically include that, and I skip a bunch of lines because the README itself has um, has a few lines that I don't actually want re-included here. I'll explain. So there's the line that says the name of the package, right? Then there's a couple lines that has like what the purpose of the package is. I want to skip those first four lines, and I just want to start with the build status because in this thing right here, I've already said what the purpose of this thing is, and it's already going to say easy queue on top of that. So I just reiterate here, you know, what's what's the tagline for the thing. And then I just say, like, skip those first four lines of the readme and include the readme here. And so that the rest of the readme, the badges, the anything I write in the readme will automatically show up. And you manually the, wrote the rest of the readme. Right, in Markdown. Okay. okay. This, by the way, this is a REST, RST restructured text uh, command. So PDoc actually handles markdown and restructured text, and it does all kinds of cool stuff. It, it knows how to process those things really well. Um, and it will process the examples in your stuff if you, if you have things with examples. So it, it does a really nice job. And the things that I'm basically doing here are you know, specifying um, I want HTML output. Theoretically, it can produce like LaTeX and PDF. And then I say which output directory I put it in docs, because GitHub will let you say, that the slash docs directory should serve the website, your GitHub IO website. So if you have you, 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 the, the link I just sent is metas.github.io slash easyq. That is all served from the docs directory on the main branch. OK, because I guess like practically when you ever get to that link, like for me, it seemed like I checked the easyq readme. And I also might check like PyPy, like yeah. read the docs. but. I didn't even know that you could get to this GitHub. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's it's like on the side of the GitHub thing, and sometimes it's indexed a little. It's hard to know exactly when um, people are going to want to see like documentation in more detail. Like if they want to see the documentation for a particular string, for a particular function, right? Um, and I have a link at the top that says. Uh, I have my little thing that's like the change log, the issues in the documentation. So in theory, someone might click documentation to get more detail. 
like they want to see the API stuff, right? How, how do you know, Dr. T like the, the readme has some examples and it's like get started and the purpose for the thing, that's kind of the purpose of the readme. If you actually want details, right? Um, of like, what is the exact parameters to this thing? You might read the docs. This is a small library. There's not that much to it. If it was a much bigger library, you could imagine people wanting to get, you know, look up more stuff. So that's kind of what that website's for. Okay. And so it will, it will generate stuff into docs, uh, into docs. And then I here, because this is a single page thing, I just move that nested index up one level because it's all just in one HTML file for adder doc. The other the other package that I recently published, I couldn't do this because there were like multiple sub modules and they were all separate HTML files. So for a more complicated thing, I don't do this. But if it's just a single HTML file, I just bump it up to the top. There's no reason not to. Um, I, I know there's just a few minutes left. Nick and I had been talking a lot about like GitHub Actions, and I yeah, 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 I was pretty excited about that. Would you be able to? Yeah, yeah. Let like... me talk about that now. Okay. Talk about that. Let me talk about that now. Um, so why don't we just talk about this? Actions, which also includes like publishing on PyPy and also GitHub pages. So GitHub pages, I basically just talked about that. Um, yeah. And um, let, let, let's talk about continuous integration. Okay, so continuous integration is the idea that when you push something, when you push something out to like publish to your to your repo more publicly, that you want a bunch of things to be done. The main reason to do this is when there's a lot of people working on a project, um, you want certain checks to happen. Like you want to guarantee, like sure, like you asked me, like how often do I run the, the 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 tests and stuff, right? I run them pretty frequently, but like, do I know that everybody else runs them? I don't. So one way to make sure that everybody does, like, to kind of enforce good hygiene, is to basically set up GitHub Actions. Um, the way it works is it will run certain bash commands under particular conditions. The conditions that are most common for me are basically like when I push something or if I merge somebody's pull request. But if somebody makes a pull request and basically says like, hey, I fixed this thing, take a look at this thing. If I merge that pull request, um, or sorry, when they push their pull request to me, these actions will all run on the code that they've that they've submitted. And it will tell me like, yeah, their thing passes all of my checks. That way, I when I'm considering whether to merge their thing or not, I can already see if it passes the checks that I would myself run on that code. Does that make sense? Yeah, sorry, can you explain a bit more like how that, I guess I, I had mostly been thinking about like developing on my own, but how can you talk more about when you're working yeah, so, on so, so, you design yeah, the so, test? You so, design. so some of these things I pull from my, like these conditions are very standard conditions. So continuous integration is the idea that every time something gets checked in and pushed that, uh, or committed and pushed, right? that a series of tests get run, a series of things, just to make sure that the code is always in a state that's not broken. You don't want to push something to main or master that everyone's pulling from if it's broken. You always want it to be in a state that's working correctly, right? Yeah. So the two cases here are when I push something and when someone else makes a pull request. If they make a pull request, right, and when I look at their pull request, I want to know immediately whether it passes all the checks. In GitHub, for example, it will give a little check mark like all all those things passed, right? In GitLab, there's its own version of this kind of thing. There's a, several different flavors of these kinds of things where run some code on stuff that gets pushed. Some people do this with like post commit hooks uh, or push post push hooks. So like if you push it to their thing, it will run some checks. There's, there's several different ways, but ultimately the story is the same. Run some code in on the code that's been committed and make sure everything still works. So now what GitHub Actions does is they've actually made it really easy to try a bunch of different conditions. Let me explain. I want my this package that I publish, I actually wanted it to, to work on all Python versions from 3.9 up through, three, uh, sorry, from 3.6 through 3.9, right? I don't only, only want one version, I want several versions. GitHub Actions will automatically spin up, in this particular case, Ubuntu machines, and install on them all those different versions of Python, multiple machines running multiple versions of Python. And then it will run all these different commands. So the first thing it will do is it'll set up Python. And they've already pre-made for you a bunch of commands. Like all these things eventually unpack into specific bash commands. Um, but they've made it for you. 
And if you configure it with this magic YAML configuration, the first step is basically setting up Python for that particular version. And it will you supply what version from this matrix, right? I mean, it's a they call it a matrix, but it's really not a matrix, it's a list. Um, you supply the Python version. Uh, and so for each of these things, that number shows up here and here. This is just a textual description. You can write whatever you want. And it uses this thing. You can look this up on GitHub, what this is exactly, and you'll see how it's how it sets up Python. Then it sets up caches for pip so that you know it's a little bit faster to install stuff repeatedly. Uh, then it checks out your repo. Then it does a, a, a fetch on the tags. I'm debating about whether I really need to do this. I read somewhere that like, if you don't do this, there's certain problems that you can have by checking out a thing that's too big. The problem with this particular line is that the very first time you run the continuous integration, um, it basically like messes up because there aren't any tags yet. So I might remove this, but I've heard this is important to do. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, then it's uh, very simple, like pip install. Oh, whatever. The, the thing that I copied this from, it first pip installs an upgrade to pip to make sure you have the latest pip and the basic things that you need to install Python packages. Then after that, you say pip install, and these are my like standard things that I install everywhere. I install black. I'm probably going to get rid of coverage because I don't need it anymore because now there's PyTest Co. Um, Flake 8, MyPy, PDoc3, PyLint, PyTest, PyTest Go. Right? This is kind of like the standard package. Then, after you've installed all those pip, installed all those things, then you run black, run PyLint, run the insane looking Flake 8, then do the static type. And I've structured these where like the simpler things that are less likely to fail, that are also don't take a long time, happen first. Right, so black is going to take almost no time. Pilot should take almost no time. This should take almost no time. If any of these fail, something's like very wrong. Like I've accidentally committed some garbage and called it Python, right? Um, this could fail. It shouldn't fail because I should check it before I push. But sometimes you forget. This is like a, you know, in my, I'm still newer to type checking, and so like it's totally possible that I would mess this up. Right. And like, oh, I forgot to like whatever. You know, I added something and I pushed it too quickly and I didn't run this locally when I should have. Wouldn't um, you still want testing? Like, I feel like if it's poorly formatted code, I feel like I, I don't care for as much versus like if I fail my test, like I want to know that first. So yeah, you could do that. You could do that. These are like since I have VS code and all these things, these are all so fast. Um I basically okay. Like it, these, these. Should, I just kind of want all the fast things to happen quickly and sort of okay. know that like the basic sanity check is done, and then it's like okay, the thing that's going to take time and it's going to be running for a little bit, and then I run docs at the end, um, just because this kind of reflects my build process, right? So it's sort of like I always format stuff. Dlint. These are small. These are small. Small potatoes. Biggest. Bigger potatoes. Biggest potato, and then just the docs at the end. Sometimes. Docs catches like weird stuff. It'll be like, oh, you didn't actually like, I don't, I don't remember what, but I remember like this actually caught something. Like trying to run the documentation in CI showed me that if I, when I was going to run documentation eventually myself, that there would be a problem. So I just have it generate the documentation every time, um, just as a sanity check, like that the documentation won't break um, when it's trying to be generated. So that's kind of what GitHub Actions. But you, if there's other things that you do, and in fact, like for example, if you know Joe, like if you know that you want to do this first, yeah, there's no problem putting that first. Okay. Yeah. For example, like Nick, he's like mostly does like uh, job development. So it sounds I bet like we can find like you know equivalent. Oh yes. For a lot of, like oh yes. Like there's there Maven totally, instead of Python. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So so okay. you you could do this for any language. Again, it's just bash at the end, and they have they have these pre set up things for every like for like basically every major language and even a lot of minor languages they have this also like we could just find that yaml file you could find that yeah yes, yes absolutely absolutely Very i good. have another one that's called qq analysis which i saw github provides like the, as a as a recommended thing so they have yeah. one that will like analyze your thing and they support these are the supported languages c++ c sharp go java javascript and it just like searches for basic vulnerabilities and things like that um 
And again, it checks out the repository and initializes with their code QL action. Um, and then it does like this auto build process that basically then whatever they, they, if you have a compiled language, it does compiling. Um, and then, uh, they perform their analysis and generate a report. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of the, um, what the, the GitHub actions are and then publishing on PyPy. Um, uh, this is basically the idea that like, so I actually have another GitHub action, um, that I can show you that is a little more magical because they've already done a lot of the work for you. But basically, whenever you publish, this is a specific, so on release, when it's published, which means when you make a GitHub release, you know how there's like a releases page and you can say like, pick this tab, pick this tag and release this package. But like, take this code from that tag and make it in, as a release. When that release gets published, it checks out, does Python, installs all the dependencies, runs setup to make sure it's buildable as a as a package, and then it runs this very specific PyPy publish action, right? Um, that that takes your basically your secret API token for PyPy as the password user's token, and it runs. Um, there's a program called Twist that. Um, that basically lets you, or Twine, sorry, Twine. Twine publishes, whatever, if you, it basically does this for you, right? It does all the magic. You don't have to remember any of the commands. You don't have to remember any of the stuff. And basically, as long as you have this API token configured in your repository, it will supply it here, and then it will automatically publish your package to PyPy, which is how you get, you know, when some people say pip install, like so you can type in pip install EZQ, the way that works is because I published it on PyPy. Yeah. All right. Really cool. We we haven't like oh, Nick and I were talking about like doing that for his his code here where we haven't done the on Maven, but I think it would, would be cool. Right. Exactly. So there's yeah. I'm sure there's equivalents for this, right? Yeah. There's equivalent commands that you do to publish stuff, and so it's nice to tie it to a thing that you're doing yourself, right? You you basically are tagging something as like this is a published thing, and then it just um it it will just basically push it out for you to the public. All right. Cool. Any questions or anything like that? I can also stop recording and thank you all for coming. And then I'll stop recording and take questions there if there's if that's a. This a is better. really great. I I, I um uh, but things uh, I'm not a Python developer, so some of the stuff need more sure. than adjusting for me. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, understood. It's more understood. about this uh, good practice because I I I think I would do more Python development in the future. So it's good to know this. Nice. Nice. All right, I'm going to stop recording. Thank you all for joining. Take care. Okay.